welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the morning as much as I did. Uh, fabulous sessions. And we're ready now for our, our plenary speech for the afternoon. Uh, make sure you do the usual silence or turn off all cell phones. We don't have to worry about those during the, the lecture. I'd like now to introduce Dr. Douglas Guybet, who's professor of philosophy at Biola University in La Mirada, California. He received degrees from Multnomah College, Dallas Theological Seminary, Gonzaga University, and the University of Southern California, where he earned his PhD in philosophy. He teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in the areas of epistemology, the philosophy of religion, as well as courses on the new atheism, the history of philosophy, and philosophy and film. He is the author or editor of several books, including Evil and the Evidence for God, Faith, Film, and Philosophy, Big Ideas on the Screen, and In Defense of Miracles, A Comprehensive Case for God's Action in History. His most recent book is entitled Being Good, Christian Virtues in Everyday Life. Dr. Guy Vett is the former president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society and he has served as a minister to college students at churches in the Pacific Northwest and in Southern California. He regularly speaks, not only in this country, but around the world on college campuses and in churches. Now I have to admit, I spent a little time getting to know Dr. Gavet through his blog. And as you know, it's amazing what you can find out about people by what they post on the internet. While I was reading Dr. Gavet's blog a few days ago, I, I learned that he loves motorcycles, he loves traveling and speaking around the world. And of all things, he loves random lines of poetry. And you have to bear with me, I'm still an English professor. Among his favorite poets are some of my favorites as well. Sharon Olds, Gerard Manley Hopkins, and especially our former poet laureate, Billy Collins. So in closing, I'd like to read just a few of the, the lines that Dr. Guyvette uh, pulled from Billy Collins because I think they capture the essence of what he's going to bring us today. In Questions About Angels, Billy Collins writes, if an angel delivered the mail, would he arrive in a blinding rush of wings or would he just assume the appearance of the regular mailman whistling up the driveway reading your postcards? This afternoon, Dr. Guy Bett will offer, offer us a glimpse of what the divine might look like on this earth. He will bring to us the big questions about the existence of God, the connection between the divine and the everyday, perhaps the meaning of life. But when he speaks as when he writes, he does so in a way that is just so humane and maybe even at times poetic. He makes sure that we understand our place in the great expanse of the universe in a way that opens up possibilities for us to see the divine in everyday life. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Douglas Guybet. Well, thank you. I have to thank Carolyn for such a creative and uh, welcoming introduction. You are blessed to have faculty and staff and administrative personnel uh, like her. I want to thank her for hosting me over lunch and for uh, Dr. Kurt Jefferson, who has been a great host to me by correspondence and others, Mita Young, who helped uh, make all the arrangements for, for me to come out here uh, from California. I think she was terrified at the prospect that I might ride my motorcycle uh, to get here. And so I, I brought, I, I came by air. Um, it's great to be here at Westminster College. Uh, one of the great things about being here for me today is that uh, my family is suffering in 100 degree temperatures in Southern California and it's a lot cooler here. Uh, I don't know how often that's the case. I think in the summer you might win that award. A few minutes before our session began, I, I had the privilege of meeting Winston Churchill. Uh, you might know that he is seated uh, downstairs in very noble attire. And so we had a nice little chat. And he said, uh, Sonny, remember, I have had to eat my words on occasion, and on the whole, I have found them quite tasty. 
he must have been thinking that would be a good advice for me, too. This afternoon, I do want to talk to you about the question, does God exist? And I thought because of the context of uh, political philosophy, for example, that is so rich and so strong here at the university or at the college, Westminster, uh, that I would quote first from the Declaration of Independence. Uh, surely you have heard about this document. Quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, Thomas Jefferson asserted these things and apparently believed them. So did all signatories of the Declaration of Independence as representatives of the American colonies. Now, I suspect that many of you believe them too. But let me just ask by a show of hands, how many here do believe these words of Thomas Jefferson? Now, notice those around you who don't and see what you can do about that. All right. Well, I believe them too. And I'd like to draw attention to some of the details of this common conviction. These, you might say, are implications, even entailments, of the statement in the Declaration. First, that we are equal and that we have these and other rights is true, he says. Second, he says, these truths are self-evident. Third, because they are self-evident, and this is an implication, we are justified in believing them. Fourth, the first truth mentioned is that we are created equal. Fifth, this equality, then, depends on the fact that we are created. And next, to be created, obviously, is to have a creator. Then, the rights listed in this passage, as well as other rights alluded to, are unalienable. To deny these rights is to infringe upon something that cannot be taken from us. And then we have these rights because we are endowed with these things by our Creator. And so, by implication, we have a Creator. And in your agreement with Thomas Jefferson, you must agree to this as well, or take exception at least to this part of the Declaration. Now this, I think, suggests that in the minds of our founders, the belief that God exists matters. And of course, they had in mind certain respects in which it matters, but there are oh so many ways in which it does. And you'll see some of the respects that I believe are most important as we get underway here. My thesis is that even if Thomas Jefferson had not written these truths into the Declaration of Independence, is that my fault? I hope it's not. Even if he did not believe them, even if they were not protected by the Constitution of the United States, by various provisions, even if there are people today who resist them and seek vigorously to conform our public lives to secular values, it is still true that God exists and that we are created by God. This is my thesis for today. And there is no greater guarantee of the rights that we have and the freedom that we enjoy than the fact that we are created by God. So the belief that God exists does matter. And so it's fitting to review the evidence that God exists. Notice that Jefferson did not say that God's existence is self-evident. He said that certain other truths which presuppose the existence of God are self-evident. They are evident, you might say, on the grounds that God exists. But what are those grounds? It's imperative, I think, that we rehearse reasons to believe that God exists and not simply believe in a casual way as if you could do so without reasons. Now, some will argue that reflection on the evidence has no place in the public square, in discourse of this sort, or in the public school curriculum, or in the politics of our day. 
the most visible and enthusiastic opponents of instruction in these things do not believe that God exists. On the contrary, they believe that God does not exist. Now, do we suppose that they have a vested interest in preventing the education of our children about the reasons to believe in, and for that matter, to deny the existence of God? This is such a fundamental question for our lives that it seems that we all ought to, be, ought to be part of the discussion in all of the context where it's possible. Now, I suggest then that our attitude toward these and other civic activities is indicated by our private con conviction about the existence of God, so that some who want to preclude discussion of this sort um, reveal in doing so a predilection to deny the existence of God. Now, to get directly to questions of evidence, I would like for you to consider the proposition God exists, simply stated. This proposition, like any other, is either true or false. There is no in-between. Whether it is true or false is really not up to us. What is up to us, though, is whether to believe the proposition. And here we have three basic choices. First, we may believe the proposition and hold that God does exist. This is theism. Second, we may deny the proposition and hold that God does not exist. This is atheism. Or third, we may withhold judgment and rather believe that God, uh, neither believe that God exists nor deny that God exists. And this is agnosticism. And so our question is, what should we believe? Now our beliefs, I believe, are justified or not in accordance with the evidence that we have. We may believe that God exists, but not be justified in believing that. We may deny that God exists, but not be justified in that. And for that matter, we may withhold judgment and not be justified in doing so. Of course, we may all have the right to believe or to deny or to withhold, but what we believe either is or is not justified by the evidence we have. So I'm suggesting that there's a difference between, or I'm drawing attention, I should say, to the difference between having the right to believe whatever you want and being justified in believing what you believe. They're not the same thing. And so you're justified in believing on the basis of your evidence, and you have a right to that belief, but you also have a right to believe in violation of the evidence that you have or to believe something that's simply not true. But now we have to ask, if God exists, what sort of evidence should we expect to have? Now this question is crucial, I think, and must be answered carefully. Typically, our interest in the question of God's existence is governed by the search for evidence that would convince us that God does exist. We decree the standards of evidence that will satisfy our minds. If the evidence rises to these standards, we may be prepared to believe that God exists. If on the contrary, we think that there are better reasons to believe that God does not exist, given our standards, then we may judge that God does not exist. If we think the evidence is counterbalanced, then we may withhold judgment, because this is indicated by our evidence that neither theism nor atheism is better justified. Now, it's natural to think that if God does exist, then God would want us to believe that God exists. And so God would make his existence evident to us. So, has God made his existence evident to us? Now, some say yes, and others say no. Those who say no believe in the absence of evidence for God. Those who say no, that believe in the absence of evidence for God, say they should believe that God does not exist. They may allow that others seem to have evidence for the, for the existence of God, but their own lack of evidence not only justifies their denial that God exists, it also challenges those who believe because of the evidence they seem to have that God does exist. Now here's why. Consider the following argument. If God exists, the first premise, if God exists, then God would want his human creatures to believe that he exists. 
Premise two, if God wanted his human creatures to believe that he exists, then God would produce evidence that would convince all of his human creatures that he does exist. Third, but some human persons are not convinced that God exists. And so, four, God has not produced evidence that would convince all that he does exist. Five, therefore, God does not exist. Now, the person who believes that God exists may think that she, at least, has sufficient evidence for believing that God exists. She may be able to recite evidence of various kinds. This evidence may be impressive indeed, but if others do not believe, then this is a defeater for her evidence and she is not justified in believing that God exists. The evidence that she has for the existence of God is not evidence that non-believers also have. And this counts against her justification for believing that God exists. Now, this is sometimes called the problem of divine hiddenness for belief that God exists. It looks like a pretty strong argument against theism, but is it? Let's return to the question, if God exists, what sort of evidence should we expect? So far, we've answered this question in terms of evidence that we think we should have in order to be justified in believing that God exists. We stipulate what standards of evidence must be met for us to have justified belief in God. But I think in doing this, we have overlooked a crucial consideration. Our standards included the assumption that God would want his human creatures to believe that he exists. Now suppose this is true. Then we should ask what sort of being God is supposed to be and then ask what sort of evidence that sort of being would provide if he wanted us to believe. What God is like then makes a difference to the kind of evidence that we should expect to ground belief that God exists. And if I'm not mistaken, in my argument that follows, the fact that some do not believe is no longer evidence that God does not exist. And so the existence of skeptics simply has no bearing on the existence of God. Now, how is this supposed to work? Well, what we do is we ask the question, what sort of being would God be if God existed? If God existed, then God would be, at the very least, utterly worthy of worship. And so he would have to have the kinds of properties that warrant worship of God. What does that mean? Well, God would have to be perfectly loving. Because in order to be worthy of our worship, he must be good. Uh, he might be powerful. He might be intelligent. He might even be our creator, whatever being is the greatest that exists. But if he is not perfectly good, then he is not worthy of our worship. Now, of course, this means then that worship is not really a burden but a natural response in recognition of God's own worthiness. Now, all I'm saying here so far is I'm certainly not saying that this is reason to believe that God exists. I'm saying this is what I mean in calling God, God. I'm saying that he would be, if he exists, utterly worthy of worship. Now, this worship that God would be worthy of would have to come from us freely. It could not be coerced because God is perfectly loving. And so whatever evidence God would provide in support of his existence so that we might believe would have to be compatible with freely allowing us not to believe and so not worshiping him. He would otherwise be less than perfectly loving and therefore unworthy of worship. So you might think it's somewhat ironic that in order for God to be God, he has to leave it open for you to believe that he isn't real. Because otherwise, worship would be coerced by whatever evidence sort of made you believe. And so it's not correct for a skeptic to stipulate that the evidence that God exists must be strong enough to convince him, or there simply is not good reason to believe. 
we can go further than this and we can say, you know, if God is worthy of our worship and respects our freedom and desires that our belief in him be more than just believe that the proposition is true, but that it reflect a desire to enter into fellowship with God because he is a personal, our, a personal being and our creator, then the kind of evidence that he would provide might not be the kind of evidence that we demand. In other words, it might be evidence that implies more than just that God exists. Maybe God doesn't really care whether you believe that proposition if that's all you're prepared to do. Maybe he wants you to believe in him and not just that he exists. Maybe he desires relationship with you. And if that's the case, he might be very indifferent about whether you believe that he exists without entering into fellowship with him. And if that's the case, then he might not play ball with you or with me if we stipulate that he provide evidence of the sort that simply shows that the proposition is true. He wants us to have evidence that he is interested in relationship with us, but he wants us to respond to that evidence in a free way so that worship itself would be free. So what sort of evidence would he provide under these conditions? Well, it seems to me that he would want us to approach the possibility of his existence with a kind of openness to the possibility of worship. In other words, if we would know on his own terms whether he exists, we would in advance, in effect, submit ourselves to the worship of God should it turn out that he exists. And skeptics in general are not willing to do that. But if they were, then I argue that if God exists, then he would provide them precisely the sort of evidence that would reward their openness to his existence and their willingness to worship. And so this is a warning about the kind of evidence that we demand for the existence of God. Now, having said all that, I don't want to say that's the only kind of evidence there is, but it's important evidence for a couple of reasons. One is that it really does respect our freedom as well as our intelligence. Second, it appeals to those who are or would be willing to worship and not just simply believe a proposition. That's a good thing. Furthermore, it is a kind of evidence that God can provide that could be much stronger than any other evidence that we might rely on. In other words, God might present us with just the sort of evidence that could convince us so that nothing could possibly defeat the justification we have for believing in him. Now, I think the kind of evidence that includes would be, for example, transformation of life. Because worship includes obedience to the commands of a perfectly loving God. This would be a transformational exercise and one that would confirm to us the reality of God's existence because we are in relationship to him. So these are reasons why we should, if we're serious about the question of God's existence, welcome this kind of evidence. But as I said, it's not the only kind of evidence we have. And so I would like to turn to some of the evidence that is a little bit more familiar to people and relate it to this larger question does God exist? But I'm going to articulate this evidence in ways that might not be entirely familiar, and I'm going to uh, present this evidence so that uh, the order in which the evidence is presented proves to be quite important, that we think about this evidence in this order so that we can see the force that the evidence has. So what is the other kind of evidence, evidence of the public sort that we can now talk about, that there is a God, a being who is utterly worthy of worship, deserving of our unqualified adoration, love, and trust, essential components in worship. Well, these reflections, I believe, support the existence of God, who is uniquely, properly worthy of worship. First, the cosmological evidence for the reality of God. Scientific and philosophical evidences today converge in support of the conclusion that the universe had a beginning. 
Now, the effort to make intelligible sense of this phenomenon leads to the inference that the universe was caused to exist by a personal being of great power and intelligence. For the beginning of the universe is an event, and as such, it has a cause. But the cause of the beginning of the universe is the first event in the series of events that make up the, to the, the total history of the universe. If the beginning of the universe has a cause, but that cause was not an event, then it must be an agent, a personal being that could bring it about. And this agent must have sufficient power, intelligence, and motive for bringing into existence a universe like ours. At any rate, the agent described here is a candidate for deity, and so far as we can tell, has properties compatible with being the god of theism, and no properties incompatible with being the god of theism. Now admittedly, this is a more modest conclusion than the conclusion normally associated with a cosmological argument for the existence of God. But this is a virtue of the kind of cumulative case for theism that I am presenting here. Because now we turn to other evidence. The evidence of design. Since the universe owes its existence to an extra natural personal agent of great power and intelligence, we naturally proceed to contemplate what is often called the evidence of design in the universe. Our initial evidence is merely that the universe had a beginning, that it has the property of being temporally finite. But a fuller description of salient features of this universe will sooner or later refer to a multitude of complexities manifest at every level of observation, whether with the naked eye or with the aid of the telescope, the microscope, or some other device to assist empirical observation. Now these other properties of the universe redound to the credit of the originator of the universe, and they bespeak an intelligence and a purpose stretching beyond the limits drawn by the initial cosmological evidence. It would be a, re a remarkable stroke of good luck, for us at least, if the creator, intent on creating a different sort of thing, or just experimenting wildly with the possibilities, accidentally caused a physical environment like ours to exist. It's especially remarkable that our universe is so conducive to the physical flourishing of human persons and other living organisms. This is indicated, for example, by the fine-tuning of the universe and the Earth's biosphere, as well as the complexity linked to function of physical organisms. All of this suggests that if our sort of universe was brought into existence by a being of sufficient power and intelligence to do so, it must have been for a reason. Presumably, our Creator has a plan, and it is good, and is good at what He does. Now, naturalists who deny the existence of God, of course, firmly believe that apparent design in the universe can be explained in terms of the laws of nature. Never mind that these laws are themselves in need of explanation since they believe they behave in such an orderly way. The naturalist thesis is dubious, I think, and perhaps the design argument as a standalone argument for the existence of God can be defended against the reductive efforts of naturalists to explain away, to explain away the impressive appearance of design. But in this argument, it's cumulative, and it suggests a different sort of response. Notice how we're led to contemplate the evidence of design and recall what we already have good reason to believe when we behold the spectacular grandeur of the universe. With apologies to the resolute naturalist, toiling away with his reductive project, we find our universe to be ontologically haunted by the fact that it was caused to exist by an extra natural agent. This alone gives us every reason we could realistically require for thinking that what looks like design really is design. God is the motive, has the motive, God, I should say, is the motive to demand a naturalistic a naturalistic explanation, a naturalistic account of apparent design that forbids acknowledgement of real design. 
in its place is a powerful incentive to acknowledge that there is design and to attribute this design to the very agent who brought the universe into existence in the first place. The evidence of design goes beyond the data of the physical universe that I've referred to so far. It includes the data of human consciousness and of human moral experience. Consciousness has a structure. Morality has an order. The psychophysical unity of moral agents involves the interaction of physical and non-physical states for ends or purposes that have moral significance. This also attests to the realization of a purpose-driven design plan that is never utilized as data, data in naturalism or even in traditional moral arguments for the existence of God or standard ways of arguing for God from consciousness. The manifestations of design referred to in this step cannot be fully described here and now, but it should be clear that the evidence of design is extensive and multifaceted. The thing to notice especially is that at this stage we have more evidence for the existence of a being of great power and intelligence, and at the same time the basis for making additional inferences about this agent. If causing the universe to begin to exist suggested intelligent purpose, how much more the arrangement of the physical structure of the universe into a fit habitat for humanity and other living organisms. At the very least, then, the Creator seems to have had a reason to arrange for the existence of creatures such as ourselves, and now we should wonder why. We now have a working hypothesis with strong initial support that there is purpose to human existence that is linked to the Creator's own intentions. Now, as it happens, other uh, as it happens, we also have the wherewithal to test this hypothesis against other data to be considered in the next few steps. And so we turn from cosmological evidence and the evidence of design to features of the human condition. Reflection on apparent design presented us with evidence pertaining to the human situation. Now that it's come to that, it is appropriate to develop a realistic description of the human situation and to get into focus those aspects that are most relevant to the question of God's existence. In fact, one reason why we ask the question, does God exist, is because we see the answer to that question, whatever it is, to be relevant to how we live our lives and make sense of purpose. Now, an honest description of the human situation is a mixed bag of positive and negative aspects. At this stage, we might pay a special attention uh, to the negative aspects of the human situ situation that bespeak our deep and paralyzing problem as human beings. Lacking purpose if without objective indicators, wondering why there is suffering in the world, not knowing what happens when we die, what it means to be a good person, what do we do when we disagree about moral judgments, and so forth. These, in combination with the results of cosmological and design evidence, lead us directly to what I think is the next natural inference. A full description of the human condition will refer to such things as moral failure and moral confusion, undeserved physical and mental suffering, mortality, uncertainty about an afterlife, the quest for personal meaning, alienation from self and others, and if God exists, our Creator, dashed hopes and dreams, and so forth. These features of human experience must be set alongside the impressive dimensions of human life that indicate an incredible, intricate design plan. Now, this can't be done without feeling a certain tension, genuine perplexity about what this design plan might be if the world of human experience is such a mixed bag of goods and evils. The whole point at this stage is to get this tension into focus so that we are prepared to ask a question of pivotal significance in our case for theism. And so we turn to the next point, what I call the need for revelation. What exactly does the Creator have in mind? Is the downside of human existence an indication that the theistic conclusion so far developed is a sham? 
Or does it suggest that the Creator's purposes are sinister? Is our Creator a cosmic killjoy? Has the Creator purposefully set, set us up for disappointment, despair, and resentment? These are possibilities. But they're not the only ones. Nor, I think, are they the most desirable possibilities. We sure hope that's not the case. And thankfully, I say, they aren't the most reasonable possibilities either. One could say that if the foregoing evidence uh, about the creator and designer of the universe on the one hand and evidence concerning the human predicament on the other is all the evidence we have, then we should conclude that our creator is unworthy of our faith, loyalty, and affection. That alone would disqualify the creator's claim to be God or he would not be worthy of worship. Now, in a more charitable mood, we might exonerate the Creator by attributing less power to the Creator than we first thought appropriate. In that case, we might suppose that the Creator is remote or aloof, not so much unconcerned as simply unaware of the human plight. Still, he would not be worthy of worship. But, you know, the evidence does not really justify any of the above conclusions. If the uh, evidences of earlier steps are all that we have, then perhaps we should remain agnostic about whether the Creator is ultimately worthy of our commitment and worship. After all, it's possible that the Creator has some ultimate purpose that is both good and consistent with the downside of human experience, but that we simply don't know what that purpose is. That's possible. It's possible that the Creator has provided a remedy for the human predicament, a remedy that has not turned up as such in any of the evidence so far considered. Now come to think of it, how could we perceive a remedy for the human situation coming from God without first recognizing the need for one? Now for most people, recognizing the need for a remedy is not going to be enough to support the conviction that there is one. On the other hand, we might hope for one. And the ingenuity of the Creator displayed in various ways set forth at earlier stages in the evidence should give us some hope that a remedy has been divinely devised. Or perhaps we should say that the attributes of the Creator that have surfaced at earlier stages do encourage in us the expectation that a remedy does exist. It is at least reasonable, or at least as reasonable, to suppose that the Creator does have a plan for solving the problems of humanity as it is to suppose that the Creator does not have such a plan. And it may turn out to be more reasonable to believe that the Creator has a plan if we can devise a way to confirm the existence of such a plan. A revelation from God would be a helpful aid in our quest. Is that really too much to ask of God? Is the Creator on our side, or even aware of our predicament, able to do something about it? With this question explicitly before our minds, we already have some basis for in expecting the Creator to intervene on our behalf, to set things straight, to make things right again. Now this expectation awaits confirmation by means that would lead on to other stages in the total case for God's existence. So now we must ask, how would the availability of a remedy be confirmed to us? Now we come to the arena of religious traditions. If the human situation, as I've described it, indicates our need for a remedy prescribed by our Creator, and is, if, as we are led to expect, by the evidence concerning the Creator that I have rehearsed, the Creator has produced a remedy, we would think, then it is to be expected that this would be manifest within the arena of human experience in some fashion. This is the arena of religious belief and practice. So the hypothesis that our Creator has arranged for the human situation to be healed may well be tested by examining appropriate religious perspectives. Now by appropriate, I mean perspectives consistent with what we have already understood 
to be the Creator's nature in relation to the universe. Suppose the Creator has all the properties needed to explain all the phenomena so far considered. This supposition is grounded in evidence that has been developed earlier on. And suppose the Creator has prescribed a remedy for the human predicament. This supposition is our hypothesis, which we seek to confirm or disconfirm. We have the basis by now for supposing that confirmation of our expectation will be found in one or other of the great theistic traditions of the world. Now it happens, not so coincidentally, I think, that these three religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all maintain that God has produced a, rem a, a revelation describing a remedy. Now we should wonder whether any such revelation claim addresses precisely the expectation that's been generated so far. Our strategy has yielded a convenient means of narrowing the field of religious options to those that are theistic. The framework of each theistic tradition presents us with means of conducting our search for confirmation. And so we ask, what do we find? Each of the theistic religions endorses a particular revelation claim. They differ in certain respects. Uh, Jews historically affirm the divine authority of the Hebrew scriptures. Christians claim that the Bible, Old and New Testaments, is inspired by God. Muslims assert that the Quran is the word of God. It is within their respective revelation claims that we are most likely to discover confirming evidence for the hypothesis of a divine remedy generated by earlier evidence. Or if not that, then clues to confirming evidences. These distinct revelation claims might be compared to see whether any one of them emerges as the one that most adequately fulfills our expectations consistent with God's existence. We should also want to know whether a particular theistic tradition enjoys special evidential support. Now, it would be reasonable to examine each tradition simultaneously, one alongside the others. Such an exercise is rendered realistic, more realistic now than ever before, by the close proximity of these religions to one another in our day, and by the comparatively greater availability of sacred texts and orthodox statements for each tradition. I suspect we have students at Westminster College who represent these various traditions. There is good reason, then, for conducting our inquiry chronologically, as it were. If humanity is in need of a word from God, our hypothesis being that our Creator is God, worthy of worship, and has produced a revelation to address the human predicament, then it's reasonable to expect some fairly strong evidence of God's provision to meet those needs. Since this condition has been characteristic of a uh, human problem as far back as our collective consciousness can reach, we should also expect God's revelation to go very far back in human history. The tradition with the longest history is Judaism, followed by Christianity as more recent, and then by Islam as most recent. Not only is the tradition of Judaism the oldest, but it goes back, as documented in its scriptures, to Abraham. In fact, its scriptures indicate a lineage going as far back as the beginning of time and the creation of humanity. Whatever one makes of Judaism on its own terms, one would do well to suspend judgment about its successful confirmation on its own terms or of our hypothesis until after examining the claims of Christianity and Islam. Now, there isn't space here for a full investigation along these lines, but the present case, I will claim, uh, because I am myself a Christian theist, is a case for Christian theism. So I'll restrict uh, my final remarks to the fortunes of Christianity on this point. It will soon become obvious that Christianity, at the very least, sets a very high standard for evidence that's needed at this stage in the case. It may meet that standard, it may not. Uh, Christianity continues, uh, claims to be continuous with Judaism which is rooted in the Hebrew scriptures and is very much a religion of anticipation of unfulfilled expectation. Christianity is a religion of fulfilled expectation with this broad prospect of more and better things to come. 
the arrangements for healing the human condition, as described in the Hebrew scriptures, appear to be provisional and temporary, proleptic of something more ultimate and satisfactory, ushered in by the Messiah, for example. Christianity maintains that this Jewish expectation is actually fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the long-awaited Messiah. At any rate, sooner or later, however one regards the relationship between Christianity and Judaism, Christianity will come under direct examination. And when it does, something remarkable and unique in the world of religions is presented as a means of testing its claims to truth. Christianity purports to be evidentially grounded in, in a historical event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Such an event would, if it happened, be about the best candidate for a miracle that one could imagine. Now, historical evidence or support for the resurrection of Jesus would go a long way towards corroborating the claims of Christianity. For if it really happened, then it would seem that God, who alone may produce such an event, given the laws of nature, had something to do with it. And if God caused the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus, this would be evidence of God's endorsement of Jesus and his teaching. In examination of Christianity, then, several things come together at once. First, at the heart of Christianity, there is a clear account of God's provision of a remedy. The Christian story, rooted in the New Testament and in express connection with the Old, is a story of restoration of humanity by means of recreation. Second, this remedy is tied to events leading up to and including the death of Jesus Christ, which in turn is directly associated with the most dramatic confirmation of his message, namely his resurrection. The background evidence presented earlier in the argument will prove relevant in evaluating this evidence for the resurrection. Third, the occurrence of a miracle of this sort, supernaturally, supernatural if anything is, and so closely linked with the heart of the Christian message about human restoration, is new evidence for the existence of God. While this evidence may not be sufficient by itself to justify belief in God, it is new evidence that tends to confirm the hypothesis of God's existence because it would be evidence that God cre uh, brought about the resurrection. Fourth, earlier evidence for the existence of a creator led to our expectation that some remedy for the human condition would turn up un under this creator's initiative. If this expectation is fulfilled, then that too is an independent confirmation of the evidence of the existence of such a creator. So the hypothesis of creator was already strong, strongly confirmed by cosmological design evidence. That evidence supported the expectation of a remedy for the human predicament. And this expectation translated into a novel hypothesis that the creator would provide a much needed remedy and thus be worthy of human loyalty, affection, trust, that is to say, worship. The confirmation of this hypothesis would enrich our conception of the creator and at the same time increase the confirmation that had already emerged at earlier stages. The idea then is that the hypothesis of God's existence is initially confirmed to a strong degree by cosmological and design evidence that this hypothesis generated something tantamount to a prediction and that the fulfillment of this prediction counts as new confirmation of the original hypothesis. Now, of course, the availability of a revelation in this case, the Old and New Testaments, Christianity is true, could very well enrich our knowledge of the Creator's nature and purposes, a revelation that could thus be a source of evidence for theism. Now, none of this would be any more than a ripe pipe dream if there was not, not enough evidence that the resurrection of Jesus actually happened. So whatever evidence there is must be collected and assessed. Whether you're a believer or not in Jesus Christ, this should matter in your quest. Such evidence consists especially in the fact that early Christians came to believe with great conviction that Jesus was raised bodily from the dead. They believed this to be so on the basis of evidence that they had. Jesus' tomb was found empty on the third day following his crucifixion, and he was seen alive again by numerous sane individuals who would have no difficulty recognizing Jesus. How strong must this evidence be? It should be strong enough by historical standards to justify the conviction that the alleged historical events really did take place. This does not mean, though, that the case for the resurrection stands or falls on the historical evidence alone. 
again, the theism indicated by the evidence earlier on plays a valuable role. For the conclusion reached by the end of earlier steps underwrites the possibility of neurons. And now our hypothesis makes it likely that a miracle would take place as the most decisive corroboration that God's own remedy is truly his own and not a counterfeit. Now there is more to say about why the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, though it must include historical data, is not limited to historical data alone. Still, the evidence for the resurrection depends on conditions, an empty tomb, Jesus' sightings, and the remarkably uniform convictions of the earliest Christians that can in principle be confirmed or disconfirmed by historical investigation. Unfortunately, skeptical historians, theologians, philosophers stipulate standards of evidence here that are not required for comparable events or physical states. But this is not surprising because we find resistance to the idea of God's existence alone unpalatable or challenging. And so I want to say that on the evidence, the God of our theistic hypothesis who has the power, ingenuity, and motive to produce a miracle, both as the guarantee of the success of his intended remedy for the human condition, and as evidence that this was his own remedy and not some counterfeit, did produce a miracle in the historically viable resurrection of Jesus Christ as confirmation that this and the gospel of Jesus provides his own remedy. Now put this together with the earlier comments about worship worthiness. Here I have rehearsed evidence of a public sort about which we might disagree. Uh, these are at least pointers to the existence of God, and not only to God, but to God's special remedy for the human condition in the person of Jesus. But we ought to be open to evidence of this sort, as well as evidence that only God himself could provide, if we were willing in advance to be worshipful of him, if it should turn out that he exists. And so, if you believe that God exists, my challenge to you is that you take seriously the necessity for evidence and consider the kind of evidence that I have su suggested. And if you do not believe, at least consider the challenge to be open to the possibility of worshiping God if God exists and thus be available, thus be open to the kind of evidence that God himself would present. Many skeptics that I have uh, talked to have said, I simply am not willing to do that. I trust that that is not your situation. Thank you.